Honey, but you can't restrict that up mixing. Freedom! Oh, that was the cheesiest opening we've ever done on a live broadcast. Congratulations, Theo. You are part of that. I love it. I don't think I can ever fill Hugo's shoes, but there you go. Oh my goodness, man. We're gonna hear we're gonna hear in the comments about that. <laughs> so Gene, I can't believe it. You have done it again. Audioholics has made another mark in the audio industry. We're we're pissing off more people than we could uh, ever imagine, I guess. You know, um, of course, I can't take total credit because it was the guys at uh, DTS and at Oro that went to the European Commission and basically said, this is unfair. This is what uh, Dolby's doing by restricting the ability to upmix and cross-mix uh, digital signals. Um, before wait, we get into that... You're getting way, okay, you're getting way ahead of everything. The yeah. first thing we've got to talk about is we have to set the stage of what's even been going on in the industry, what up mixing is. So why don't you give a little bit of an intro for that? All right, about a year ago, and, and this is cool now because we have the ability to share cool comments that come up here. And guys, don't forget about the super chat feature in case you really want to stand out here. So we've been following this story. We kind of, I, I got hold of a secret Area 51 kind of memo that went out to the entire industry last year of basically any company that's licensing Dolby or Dolby Atmos uh, technologies in their products, they got this memo directly from Dolby that said, effective in 2019, all new products that are produced with Atmos or Dolby variants, whether it's Dolby Digital, uh, Dolby True HD, Dolby Digital Plus, whatever, will not, you'll not be allowed to upmix those signals with other codecs, other upmixes like DTS, Neo X or the Oromatic uh, upmixer for Oro 3D. And conversely, they don't want their stuff mixed with other upmixers. So it, and they made this very clear that they did not want mix and match. They did not want to play well with other uh, competitors. The interesting thing about that, though, is they they claim they wanted to preserve the integrity, the integrity of their signal, right? That's right. Okay, if you want to preserve the integrity of your signal, why are you allowing third-party uh, DSP overlay on top of your signal? For example, if you have a Yamaha receiver that has 56 DSP modes to make your home theater sound like a German bathtub in a cathedral, that's okay. You could put that on top of an Atmos signal, but you can't take a Dolby Digital or, or Atmos signal and upmix it to Aromatic because that will pollute it. So Gene, what we're really talking about here is it really seems as though there's been some industry bias, doesn't it? Specifically targeting DTS and Oro 3D. Absolutely. You know, and, and Dolby, I think, I think their big move, and obviously I don't know all the behind the scenes, but I think their big move was to monopolize the whole uh, streaming, um, the whole streaming market going forward with the new standard for ATSC 3.0 and beyond and they just didn't want any other codecs involved in in their in their space and you and i both know that dolby was never a fan of oro they never they never unified a speaker layout that would work with all three formats dts is like we'll work with whatever format but but dolby was very specific about the angles of their speakers they didn't want to do the front heights and the rear heights like you did with oro it's just there was always kind of this fisticuffs between the two brands which I think is stupid because I think in a free market, let's we're supposed to be in a free market, we're supposed to be a capitalistic society. You want diversity, you want competition because it makes your product, it makes you strive to be better. So by eliminating people, by doing some shady deals in the background and trying to like weasel your way out, weasel other people out of a standard, in my opinion, is not the best way to get you the best product to, to have the spirit of a free market. Well, well I'd, I'd agree with that. And, and Gene, let's let's take a, another step back if we can, because we're going to have some people who are dialing in who don't even understand what a basic up mixer is. So why don't we start with the basics and then let's kind of ramp back up to where we're talking about Dolby, Oro, and DTSX. So tell me, uh, what is an up mixer? 
Okay, before I do that, I saw a couple of comments saying that you they're getting bad echo from you. So I don't know if you have if you're playing us back in the background, maybe check on that. You sound fine to me. But you know, we're an audio channel. We're always going to get ridiculed for the audio quality of our broadcasts. Didn't so, you know that I was applying the DTS up mixer on wow. an Oro 3D signal that's coming through? That's why everybody's hearing an echo. Right. So, they, oh, it's, ba it's bouncing off your Captain America shield. Here, look. This is from Lance. Your voice is bouncing off that metal frisbee behind you. <laughs> You got to put some uh, absorption back there, my friend. It's the vibranium shield. Yes. So, all right. Yeah, that's a good idea. There's people were asking, what is an up mixer? I saw that question before, if I could find it, and somebody actually answered it for us. Um, yeah, here it is. So, Lance again. Up mixing is the ability to extract sound in a 5.1 or 7.1 encode in the Atmos speakers above. It gives a fuller sound stage and improves non-Atmos sound nicely. I like that. But it also does more than that because you could actually take a two-channel source, not even a 5.1, and then you could upmix it to 5.1, 7.1, 7.1.4, 11.1, 11.2. Um, I mean, it, there's just all these different possibilities. And we got an email from Wilfred, who's the CEO of Oro 3D, after we posted the article about Dolby withdrawing their upmixing uh, restriction, saying, you know, we're glad that this happened, and we were instrumental in also pushing this forward with the European uh, Commission. And we've heard so many of our clients, so many consumers that have products that have Atmos, DTSX, and Oromatic, claiming they actually prefer the sound of Oromatic upmixing sometimes over the native Atmos mix. So it's just great when you have that ability to pick and choose what you want to listen to. Like for example, when I listen to, I do a lot of two channel uh, music listening that I up mix um, either with ProLogic 2 music mode or, or now I use the DSU, which is the Atmos version. Or sometimes I use the DTS, um, the, the one before the new one, before Neural. And it really depends on the source. There's some music that sounds better with different up mixers. It's not all equal. And um, in fact, I've found, I have like a Yamaha 5100 processor that has the ProLogic 2 up mixer and the DSU. And if I just want to listen to a straight two channel mix to 7.1 without the height effects, I find that the ProLogic 2 music mode sounds better in those instances especially even when you do 5.1 um, up mixing to 7.1, it just, you hear those side channels, they're more discreet, they're more in your face. So it's really a matter of preference and that's why I like having all these options on my palette. Now I would say that you can go one step further because you have different speaker layouts. You have a Atmos and DTS X layout, then you have an Oro configured layout with the voice of God. Why don't you give some perspective on that, and then we'll go over a little bit about what this ruling means and what the products going forward, what it, what it all is going to pan out to. Sure. Uh, so, Gene, to jump on a couple of things that you were saying is the great thing about up mixers is you can really apply them to any signal that, that's coming in. And um, before we were on, like we were talking last night, uh, I took a little bit of time and I was listening to some two-channel music uh, in the two different setups that I have. So um, the upstairs setup right now is uh, all Focals. And I think I'm actually hearing some of that echo that people are talking about. So I'm gonna disconnect my headset for one second and see if that fixes it. Now we have dead space. Okay. And hopefully that's done it. So uh, it sounds, it sounds nutshell, way worse. I did is I started testing out the uh, the different um, up mixers that I have on the Anthem. Uh, I have an AVM60 and also on the Denon 8500. And one of the things that I noticed was that they sound different uh, in the setups. There were some things that I found to be the same, but also some things Okay, sound is worse. We'll figure that out for the audio guy and the networking guy. <laughs> this, is all, this is almost a comedy routine. Can't win. No. Well, you know, we're you know, in our defense, we're using a program called Streamyard. Um, it's much easier to do sharing on the screen than OBS, but the quality is not quite there. It's still in beta, 
So, but at least we got something going and we have the message coming out. So, all right, go ahead. Just continue what you were saying. Okay. And is that, yeah, I still got some latency uh, that's going on there. So anyway, in a nutshell is I tested some things up in the, the Anthem AVM60 and I also tested some things on uh, the 8500. And there are some similarities between the way the up mixers um, are working. But what is kind of interesting, I still had a preference with certain up mixers. And there's also, I think, uh, a tendency where I didn't like it with two channel all that much. So I know you and I have had that conversation back and forth um, that for me, I'm not a big up mixer fan with two channel. And, and some of the notes that I took were um, as follows uh, this evening um, when I got home is I felt as though if you're the type of user who really likes a detailed pinpoint sound, you're probably going to tend towards uh, the Dolby surround up mixer. And if you're the type of person who likes a really large sound stage that has that sensation of depth and breadth, you're probably gonna prefer the Oro 3D up mixer, the Oromatic. And if you're the type of person who likes a more diffuse sound field, the DTS-X um, up mixer, Neural X, may be the, um, the up mixer of choice. Um, personally speaking, I am a big fan of the Oromatic up mixer. I've been yeah. a big fan of Oro 3D, and I absolutely side with my friends over there. And I think it's really one of the compelling reasons of why I still would like to see Oro 3D um, in pre-pros and in AVRs. Um, it's a channel-based as opposed to an object-based, uh, you know, technology uh, to a certain degree. Um, and it just works really, really well. And the other thing I'll just uh, close quickly with some initial observations, the base is different depending on which up mixer um, I was using between the three. And I found that to be a very, very interesting thing. So um, as I've sort of uh, pegged the full over the years, I've seen some people be really staunch defenders of Dolby, some staunch defenders of DTS, and other people who are staunch defenders of Oromatic. And I think each one is gonna cater um, to your particular taste. So what's the point? This Dolby ruling absolutely is something that is a big win for us audio fans because it gives us the choice to use an up mixer that caters to what our audio preferences is, are. Yeah, absolutely, man. Because it really, a lot of this is source dependent and it's great to have the variety of different up mixing capabilities. So I wanted to um, share the screen and in case anybody hasn't, the people watching here have not seen the article. Um, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen at this point. On the home page right now, we have this article called Dolby Withdraws Out Mix and Restriction, a win for consumers. And this thing's got a lot of shares since yesterday, man, almost 400 shares. So this is getting a lot of attention because it, I think it is a big thing. And um, it's very interesting to the fact where if you look at what Dolby said on their page, effective immediately, Dolby is withdrawing all limitations, including limitations contained in Dolby license on the use of OEM first-party and third-party post-processing technologies, including up mixers and virtualizers, on audio decoding from Dolby format, including Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, True HD, Atmos, on AVR, soundbars, and TVs. So that was quietly put on their website, and I didn't even notice it until I got the press release from Xperi, which owns DTS. And they basically talk about the whole situation here and then in their view, the Dolby policy was anti-competitive, anti-consumer, and a blatant abuse of Dolby's industry position. And I couldn't agree with that more. And we've seen this, you know, since Atmos came out, we've kind of seen this play by Dolby, mostly when they, when they started licensing the Bouncy House speaker, which is funny because there's a Bouncy House speaker ad on our site right now from Amazon. <laughs> and... Um, that speaker always is kind of my is kind of my um, Achilles heel because I know what they were doing behind that. Dolby was trying to become a speaker company, in my opinion. They tried to license a really poorly designed driver, a little wizard cone woofer, three inch wizard cone woofer, and they put an eight or nine element complex analog crossover behind it to create a human a head related transfer function 
that was just ridiculous. You don't want to do something like that in the analog domain. That's something you should do with DSP. But they were trying to get all these different companies to license this technology from them. And they were trying to do the bouncy house speaker and they marketed it as a good, as good or better alternative to discrete speakers. And in my opinion, a lot of this had to do with them, again, wanting to be the licensed king, wanting to be kind of a THX in the industry. And it just left a bad taste in my mouth, especially since they were promoting a compromised solution, which it can work. It's, I'm not arguing that it can't work. It, it definitely has some merit if you absolutely can't put a speaker in the ceiling. Bouncy House can work, but it has limitations. It has a very small sweet spot. Um, it could cause a lot of different uh, localization issues if you're too close to the speakers. There's just a host of technical reasons, which I won't engage in in this video because we've spoken about this for the last three or four years. But the point of the matter is they were pushing this on the industry. And I feel like what they were doing with this policy by trying to restrict uh, cross-mixing and up-mixing, they were doing the same thing again. And it's like they're just trying to flex their muscle. But they're not really that muscular when it comes down to it because, you know, the, the Atmos Bouncy House speaker really hasn't gone on to an industry adaptation like they hoped. And then they got slapped down with this, um, with this uh, antitrust thing and now they're no longer restricting their decoder or their upmixing. So I just, I find it interesting that if you bring enough awareness to a situation, enough consumer awareness to a situation, enough industry awareness to a situation, then we win by default at the end because people are going to stand up and say, this isn't fair. And that's why I put our friend William Wallace here. You know, you can take away our, you, you can take our money, but you can't take away our upmixing. And it all goes back to kind of the truth and power movement with the uh, verifying the amplifier uh, power and receivers and how the manufacturers were trying to fudge that. And we called them out on that. We had a petition going. We have over a thousand signatures on it. So it's, you got to stand up for this stuff. You have to have kind of a, we kind of have to be the consumer advocacy group. So we try to bring these um, situations and bring this out to people, to consumers, because we have the audience. You know, between YouTube, Facebook, the editorial site, forums, Instagram, we reach almost 2 million people a month. So we're going to find these issues and we're going to bring it out. And hopefully um, we are on the right side of the argument and we can win for everybody. And then there could be the diversity there for you and there could be truth in claims and truth in marketing. And uh, everybody wins at the end because you get a better product. I couldn't agree more. And Gene, I think, um, you know, we, we've heard it on the forums, we've heard it, uh, you know, stated in a couple of different places. If it really wasn't what you've been doing with Audioholics uh, all these years and really advocating um, for all of us enthusiasts, uh, I think the industry wouldn't be where it is today and we'd all be impoverished uh, for it. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And it's, it's a dying industry in terms of objectivity. Um, we're seeing less and less magazines that are doing measurements now. In fact, we're one of the last magazines that actually objectively measure component performance. And now you're seeing all these YouTube channels popping up where they're just kind of like influencer channels that are just giving very cursory unboxing videos and uh, quick reviews. And it's, it's ter that's kind of the trend now when it comes to doing reviews in, in this industry. So we kind of have to double down and, and try to stick to the facts and give you guys the meat that nobody else has given you. And I know it takes more work and more effort and it always, doesn't always make us popular with manufacturers or, or uh, people out there that don't like to get this technical, but that's how I'm always going to run Audio Hawks. And you know, as long as I own Audio Hawks, that's how it's going to be. Absolutely. And I think, Gene, that's also one of the things that, uh, again, is a real differentiator. And, and can I offer uh, a different pers perspective, too, that we haven't necessarily talked about with why the upmixing is important is I, I think in addition to the angle of choice and then maybe audio preference, it really keeps the manufacturer, in this case, it's Stolby, honest with trying to have the best um, mixing and production suite available because it really um, provides everyone, um, I, I don't know what the right word is, but everybody's got to stay on their toes because you're 
speaking to whether you're um, authoring um, an, an ultra uh, HD 4K Blu-ray or you're um, mixing for multi-channel audio, whatever it may be, you're going to want to use the product that's going to um, give you the tool set as an artist to uh, portray what you intended in the home. And um, what we've seen already, you know, let's talk about what DTS is now trying to do with IMAX Enhanced is this is a very, very competitive space. And when one manufacturer has the ability to put up a, a so-called firewall and block everybody in, it um, you know prevents that competitiveness that I think is um, important in the industry uh, that ultimately the consumer can benefit from. Yeah. Uh, there's a question that keeps coming up here. I think we should answer it. I'm confused why if a signal is formatted that way, why would one want to process it into something else? Um, again, that goes back to the point, I'll give you one example that really rings true here is there are sound bars on the market, like for example, the Nakamichi, that doesn't have the licensing to do Dolby uh, 5.1 or above. It just does a Dolby digital stereo signal, but it has all the DTS processing built in. So if you get a two channel Dolby stream into this box, the way if Dolby had their way, you would only be able to play with two channel, even though this Nakamichi is a 7.1.4 system you couldn't up mix it with the DTS up mixer. So that's, you know, that's one example of a restriction. And again, the other thing we said too, is if you have a two channel Dolby or a 5.1 channel Dolby uh, digital signal, you might not want to use the DSU up mixer. You still prefer, you might prefer the Oromatic up mixer, or you might prefer the DTS Neural X up mixer. Why not have that choice? Why limit yourself to just one up mixer when you already have three built into your product? usually two. The only products that give you all three in the consumer space really are the Denon and Moran's products. And, and Gene, another um, angle to answer that question is, you know, hey, you know, you're in a space where you have um, a 7.1, a 5.1, or you have a 13.1 or a 7.1.4. In other words, you have a lot of speakers and, and you love that sensation of an enveloping surround sound. And uh, one thing I'm a big advocate of, even though I'm not the same boat as you, we've had these conversations, I don't like up mixing my two channel to multi channel. Um, I love up mixing a 5.1 or a 7.1 movie to an immersive audio format. And the reason why I like up mixing in answer to that style of question is A, I feel that it really expands the sound stage. B, I feel that it adds a dimensionality and um, uh, an immersive quality that is lost in a traditional uh, two dimensional surround sound mix. So the reason why I would want to up mix something from five channels to 13 is because the experience is different the experience is more engaging and I get into the movie and the action a whole lot more than I would um, when I just use the straight 5.1 or 7.1 signal. Once you up mix, you can't go back. Yeah, well, I, and, I, and I will tell you this, and I don't know if you tried this already, but if you get a chance and you want to up mix a two channel audio signal with the DSU, make sure you set, set the center spread to wide Otherwise, everything's being dumped into the center channel. And that's maybe why you don't like doing the up mixing for music. The center spread off feature is good if you're doing a two channel movie and you want that, you know, anchored center channel. But it absolutely sucks when you try to listen to music with it uh, center spread turned off. And that's my big gripe with DTS. And I'm not just like come putting the hammer down on Dolby. I'm just putting the hammer down on Dolby now because of what they're doing here. But I have a beef with DTS as well because I don't think their new up mixer, the Neural X up mixer, is as good as their older one when you're up mixing two channel uh, music. I think they did a really poor job of finishing that up mixer because there's no way of turning that center spread on. Um, if you turn on the Neural X and two channel music, it just dumps everything to the center channel. It sounds terrible. So I never use the Neural X up mixer for two channel music. It sounds fine if you take a 5.1 signal and, uh, and mix it to 7.1.4. I mean, it's similar to the Dolby, uh, the DSU up mixer. I don't have enough experience with the Oro 3D mixer, but I know you're a huge fan. I know yeah. uh, Dr. Floyd Tool set up his home theater with Oro in mind, and a lot of studio people are really into Oro, uh, Oromatic and Oro 3D. So there's definitely something to it, and one of these days I will um, probably reposition some speakers and try it out. and. 
And because I have it on my Marantz SR8012, it's just a matter of, of getting the speaker positions right and, and getting it set up for that. That's true. Or you come visit. That's, yeah, there you go. I mean, that's, that's an incentive to come and I want to hold that shield, man. I want to wear that shield. <laughs> that sounds good. So, so Gene, let me ask uh, the question in a little bit of a different manner. So we've won as consumers. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean from a product side? Is has this um, this decision had any negative impact on the consumers thus far that needs to be undone? In other words, are, are, uh, do I have to worry that I've now bought 15 different products or five products or three products that have this Dolby limitation that I'm going to be stuck with? That's a good question. And I was going to bring that up next. The only products I know of that I have documentation of that have this restriction built in are the new Emotiva processors, the RMC1 and the XMC2. They designed those products, they coded those products based on that mandate from last year. It's not their fault. They were following you know, what Dolby's letter of intent was. And I give them credit because nobody else did. The Denons, the Marantz's, Yamaha's, the Ankyos, none of those guys, um, none of those guys were restricting the up mixing as far as I know. And somebody asked a question on our forum on the Emotiva page about, are you guys going to reverse that now? And it doesn't sound like it's so easy for them to just flip a switch. They're going to have to do some major recoding and another firmware update in order to um, allow that feature now to work again to do the cross and up mixing. So it's going to be interesting to see what RMC1 and XMC2 users report. I know they're kind of shaking out a lot of bugs on those products right now, so I'm sure this won't help that they're going to have to, you know, change that code while also fixing other bugs at the same time. I know it's probably not a fun time for them over there. So I shouldn't have as a consumer, I shouldn't worry about any product. This really isn't something that, oh my gosh, I shouldn't buy any product in the 2017, 18 or 19 um, model year because there was a limitation imposed. This, in a sense, saved the industry from going down a path that the, that the consumer would um, be penalized for. Yeah, this, this, uh, that's a good point. And I don't think that any products, any of the major products have been penalized or have been restricted based on the Dolby mandate. I just don't think they had enough. They had enough. They didn't have enough time to enforce it. You know, I think um, I think this got thwarted just in time to avoid that product cycle change and all the firmware on all these products. So I think everybody should be good when it comes to that. So, so Gene, I want to ask another question too. Uh, we, cause I'm going to say we were um, all, there was a group of us, right. That were on this thread over the past couple of days. And then we were talking offline on it. This really came about because of Europe, not the U S am I correct in uh, that assumption? That, as far as I could see, yes. And it's probably because Oro 3d is a huge player in Europe. So this would have affected them more than it affected affected them there more than it affected them here. So realistically, if this had gone through um, the U.S. system, uh, this might have taken a little longer. And I'd be just uh, I'd be curious if either anyone who's uh, watching the broadcast or has some of the comments at a later point provide some insight as to why you know, these companies felt that it was important or why they had an advantage of, um, you know, lobbying uh, this uh, at the EU as opposed to in the U.S. Yeah, I can't really answer that. I don't know all the dynamics of it other than from what we saw in the press releases. So. Well, it's good stuff. The consumer wins. The consumer wins again. So we got to keep vigilant on this stuff. We got to keep the amplifier power honest and we got to keep our up mixing options open. So Gene, what else are you going to undo? You've got a couple of more months in the year to make your mark again in 2019. You know, I got, I guess I got to think about that one. I'm just like so focused right now on Cedia coming up in two weeks. And we're going to be covering that show, doing YouTube coverage and live coverage and, and uh, looking at all the interesting products. I'm kind of excited to see uh, Mono Price's new um, 16 channel uh, DTSX. Oro 3D and Atmos processor. So I want to see a demo of that. I'm kind of like, it's based on the data set model. So, you know, that's going to be a stable platform. 
and there's some interesting speaker products coming out from all the press releases I've been seeing. So this is going to be a good show, guys. Um, from September 10th through the 14th, we're going to be covering the show, and you're going to see uh, some interesting content popping up here on our YouTube, on Facebook, and on audioholics.com. So, Gene, I think until uh, Cedia, we, we've got a wrap here, unless there's any other comments that are in the forum, everybody uh, watching. This was a pretty cut and dry um, show. And I think it's, again, another uh, feather in your cap and a feather in the cap of Audioholics of fighting for the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the fact that we have the such a large audience helps. You know, we I stand behind the audience. That's where the power comes from. I'm just sending out the message and hoping people respond to it. Um, I think that's it. Uh, someone talked about here how Oro seems to be the big winner. Perhaps this will put them in on, on the fridge in the U.S. in a more mainstream position. I wish Anthem could upgrade the, my AVM60 to have that feature now. Yeah, I don't know what Anthem um, is going to do. They don't. They didn't announce any plans, as far as I know, on on refreshing the AVM60 or anything like that. They're still I wouldn't show, bank on it, and I don't yeah, have any showing, They're showing the SPR stuff and new speakers and stuff like that. You know, Paradigm and and um, Martin Logan, but I don't know if there's a lot of Anthem stuff coming out for Cedia. I don't think so, and, I, and I'm, I don't know who posted that specifically, but that's been um, when I first got the uh, AVM60 review in, unit in, that was actually one of the comments that I had um, to the back end is, will we be able to see an Oro 3D update? And um, the standard response I got is Anthem is always uh, exploring new technologies and opportunities, and we're um, you know going to be monitoring the market. So I think what we have here is, um, when it comes to some of these more um, high-end boutique uh, processors and, and AVRs, uh, they're going to be a little gun-shy uh, adopting some of these uh, technologies that aren't necessarily mainstream and, and may or may not take hold. And um, But I'm right there. I really wish that Oro 3D was in more products so more consumers could have a choice and experience what, what is really a great technology. Yeah. Um, this is the last comment I want to kind of showcase and then we'll kind of cu cut this off. But this is this is interesting because this is kind of what I was thinking too. Dolby is also still stinging from how badly DTS Master destroyed Dolby True HD in the last round of sound format competition in the past several years. You're right. If you look at any of the old Blu-ray movies, I would say a good portion of them, maybe 80% of them, at least the ones I own, all had DTS HD as the default soundtrack. <clears throat> so they won that round, but now Dolby won the round in streaming. I think Dolby's really uh, kind of mastered or dominating streaming right now. And streaming is the future, so. For good or ill. And uh, I don't know. Well, let's see where ATSC 3.0 goes. That's uh, For those of you who don't know, that's going to be really the emerging broadcast standard. And immersive audio is part of that spec. So we will finally be able to get... Um, immersive audio with uh, over the air broadcast. So I, I think the future is bright and um, this ruling is going to have ripple effects uh, for years to come to our benefit. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please thumb it up, like it. If you do uh, subscribe to the channel, if you aren't hit the bell notification, so you know, next time we go live and don't forget to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. And Teo, thank you again for standing in over here, braving it out with that Captain America shield causing all the reflections in the background. It was actually my speakers were up too high, of course, so it was my fault your audio sucked. I'm glad I could, help. I'm glad I could elevate myself and bring you down in the process. That's great. And I think your Tribble always does it. Yes, my, my, he's not angry today. He's very friendly. He's in a good mood because he's got his up mixing capability. All That's right, great. well, we're going to wrap this up. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.